Hey yo, what up slackers? Today I'm gonna be talking about tennis, or rather the history of tennis. Um, why tennis? Well, this is a sport where we Asian kids tend to excel in, but hardly ever make it to the professional level or to be ranked among the top whatever in the world. Mm, it's it's kind of strange that way. The popularity of the sports amongst Asian kids worldwide, I'm not just talk talking about here in America, but worldwide, Asian kids love tennis. And Asian parents love to put their kids through tennis programs with the hope that they can outcompete other Asian kids to be the best Asian kids at playing tennis so that they can be ranked amongst the best players in the world. But, but as they progress, um, that hardly ever happens. And I just first wanted to say why tennis is so, um, in my, in my opinion, why tennis is so popular amongst Asians. And I think the first reason was, or the first reason is rather that there are two reasons in my mind. Okay. First reason is that it's not a team sport. And the second reason is that it doesn't require sheer physical strength. So those two reasons. Yeah, that's quite, I guess, um, judgmental of me to be putting those two things on the line and to be discussing them, saying, because tennis doesn't require those two things, so Asians can be relatively good at it. But, you know, I'm Asian, and obviously by the way that I talk about this sport, I don't play tennis, otherwise I wouldn't be talking about it that way. So the the bottom line is that we Asian kids, um, most of us Asian kids aren't very good at team sports. Well, just not just the Asian kids, but look at look at um, all the all the sporting events in the world. Which team sports are we we as an Asian country is good at? Can you name one? Uh, so, you know, put that in combination with the physical strength part. Let me ask you this question, rather. Which team sport that requires physical strength are we, we as an Asian countries, good at? I challenge you to give me an example. So, if you say something like maybe soccer, I mean, Korea, Japan, those are pretty good they, they, they they're pretty decent in the way that they play and uh they've done some amazing things in the previous uh world cups in the history of the game but that is in comparison to other asian countries i'm talking about putting them um in perspective of their competitors from other places then you don't really see any advantage or any achievements there because we Asians are obviously underachievers in the in the realm of team sports in combination with strength and or physicality because we don't I guess from a physique perspective we don't really have that physical strength um to compete in some of the more physical sports such as football or wrestling um and let, let's put it this way it's incorrect to say that we don't have the physical strength because everything can be measured in terms of statistics and in statistics there's always okay if you compare the physical strength of a race. Oh, that sounds so wrong, but I'm going to say it anyway. If you put the physical strength of races, you know, next to each other to compare it and put, and so that, that's not going to be a single point unless you're just taking the average because we're talking about a median here, a median of strength across different races. Um, and that median is going to be falling in between a minimum and a maximum. And for each race, the median is going to be different. So is the minimum and the maximum from all the other races. And the range, which is, I guess, the, the deviation of 
how do I explain deviation? The distance between the median to the minimum and to the maximum is also going to be different across different races. So I don't know where the, the, the median, the range, and the minimum and maximums fall, but I can safely say that for Asian for Asians in the category of strength, the median is going to be much, much, much less than the median for Caucasians or Blacks. So, um, or African, I guess, people of African descent. Um, so, because of that, um, of course, you know, there are anomalies, or, or I should say outliers um, of that example. So, if you were to take the strongest Asian kid um, against, I guess, a black kid that is below median in strength um, in, in, in his own race, I guess, um, then you would probably have an evenly matched competition to say in a wrestling ring or in a boxing match or in a, um, in a football game. But that is, if you were to take the strongest and the biggest Asian kid against a below average, below median black kid, and they would probably be on par. So you see what I'm saying? You have to find the median in order to compare the relative um, values of a, of a certain parameter like strength in between two different races. So... Um, all that, um, all that remark, you know, all that politically in incorrect remarks aside, I think tennis is a great place for Asian kids to explore their potentials because it takes out uh, or eliminates both of those two factors that are heavily, where they are heavily disadvantaged at. And it, it's, it's wonderful, but it's just a shame that um, that they don't they, they tend not to keep developing into that professional level where if you see like in American high schools, Asian kids tend to dominate in the tennis teams because that's pretty much the only sports that they do dominate. Um, and that doesn't totally translate that totally doesn't translate to the professional level where you see the top. 50 or 25 ranked players in the world. Very few of them are Asians. And um, that's kind of that's kind of sad. And I think a lot of it has to do with um, the importance that strength plays in sort of the, the game, into the game at the highest level. Dude, I don't really know much about tennis, but I can just say this from watching even a few tennis plays. It's, it, it matters, okay? So strength absolutely matters, and that's something that you just physically cannot make up for. So it's going to be difficult, but again, there will be outliers, and the outliers will be those that proves us wrong. So please, let there be more Asian kids that rise up to the ranks of top players in the world. I really look forward to that day. And uh, yeah, all that blabbing aside, I need to talk about today's idioms. By the way, so uh, in addition to the idioms or the phrases that I'm trying to uh, uh, collect or put together for for these random episodes of me just blabbing, I'm also trying to incorporate some vocabulary. So meaning not just phrases, but also words, individual words that I find uh, really elegant or really to the point when you're trying to convey a certain point and it's going to help you make your speech more concise and more it just sounds better i, I don't know what other than the word elegant um what's the see i have a lack of vocabulary obviously had i known what that word that describes elegance is i would have said it right now but because of my lack of vocabulary in the English language, so I can't describe it to you. That's that's kind of a shame, 
But of course, what I'm trying to do is also to expand on my own vocabulary while going going over these with all of you. And um, I hope you find these vocabularies as well as idioms helpful. Okay. The first one is metal. And it's not like the metal, like not the the uh <laughs> not not the, the metal as in like uh, iron or silver. Um I'm talking about metal, the, the verb metal, metal with. So this I mean, we all know what this word means, given that this is an election year 2020. Um, because we hear so much about hearing that the Russians or the Chinese meddling with U.S. election. Okay, so that, that's just been a word that's been thrown around. Uh, that's been thrown around for, for the, the entire duration that leads up to the election and even after the election. For the, the entire Trump administration, I guess that's what the Democrats are saying. And then, I guess for the it's gonna happen this, the same way for the next four years in the Biden administration. The Republicans are say are gonna say that somebody else meddled with this election. So, you know, that's what meddling means to interfere. Okay, interfere with. The second one is indispensable. This is also some. Uh, something really easy to understand. Just an essential piece that cannot be re, uh, cannot be replaced. It's an essential piece of a bigger piece. So that makes something indispensable. Um, the third one is, this is actually a phrase, and that is reflective of their own judgment. It's, I think generally it doesn't come out in, in this order or it doesn't have to come out in this particular order, but I just really like the way uh, that this this phrase is being put together. You can pretty much throw this at everything if you want to. Ex if you want to, um, yeah, just say that someone is wrong. <laughs> it's reflective of their own judgment because it doesn't. You don't. You don't agree with it. It only reflects what they believe basically the word reflection or reflective can be uh used in this general sense to say that to to kind of bring out a reason of why someone did something or someone said something it's because it's a reflection of their own judgment you know what i mean so yeah use that and just makes you sound smarter um and makes your argument more compelling, although it is absolutely not compelling. Um, the last phrase of the day is a catalyst for change. Uh, this is this sounds really sophisticated because the word catalyst sounds really deep and cool. The word catalyst comes from chemistry. I don't know if you all remember from high school chemistry, a catalyst is something that lowers the activation energy of a reaction, a chemical reaction. Damn, that's 100% nerdy of me. But um, that's what it is. And shit, how do I remember that from eighth grade chemistry? That is, that that is, shouldn't be eighth grade. Eighth grade, we didn't take chemistry. Um, yeah, that, that is amazing. But it just means that it kind of kickstarts a change for an event. It's used to describe an event that kickstarts the change, um, that triggers the change in a certain field or in a certain um, arena. So let's uh, let's try to incorporate all of these idioms or cool words, big words, into what we're talking about in the history of tennis. Okay. The racket sport, traditionally named lawn tennis, now commonly known simply as tennis, is the direct descendant of what is now denoted real tennis or royal tennis. Oh, I guess it's not real tennis, it's real tennis. By the way, the word real is also really cool. Kind of also like, never mind, it's a... Uh, uh, 
Yeah, just remember the word real is cool because in front of any noun, you can put the word real and make it sounds more royal because that's what it means. Um, I think the word real is from Spanish and it just means royal and it, it just makes everything sounds cool plus exotic, okay? So if you have a, a corner store, a corner convenience store, it can be called the real shop and, and um, are rebranded as a real shop or um, you have a laundromat um, just <laughs> at the street corner, you can also call it the real laundromat, okay? So that's, you know, that, that's just how you, uh, yeah, how you transform the image of a small lo local, uh, local small business by renaming it or by adding a name Real in front of it. And, um, yeah, I got sidetracked. I apologize. Or Royal Tennis, which continues to be played today as a separate sport with more complex rules. Way to go, way to go, the elites for keeping us normal people from getting to know your world. Because that's exactly what makes something more coveted and more, be, meaning more desired um, by us common people. It's something that we can't get. People are just shameless because they always want to get something that they can't get. You know, if you teach them tennis, the rules of tennis, but you keep the real tennis for yourself or the royal tennis for yourself, yourself meaning the elites, then we common people are so curious about what's this whole thing about real tennis. Um, we're so curious, so we we want to know what, what it's about, okay? And, and that's, that's the same thing with everything else in life, all the luxuries and luxury brands. All the things that we commoners can't easily get, we want it. We absolutely want it. Elites, rich people, please share that part of your life with us. But don't share too much, because if you share too much of it, we'll pick it up very quickly and um, be able to practice on it and get good at it. And by then, the, the, the thing is not cool anymore. Just look at golf. We Asian kids, talking about golf, man, I know I'm talking about tennis today. Look at the women's game. I can hardly still call the U.S. Open the U.S. Open because every year is guaranteed that an Asian girl wins it. Um, I, I think that has happened for the last ten years. So why do you just why don't why do you just why don't you just rename it like the U.S. Open for Asian players or up and coming Asian players? Because that's what U.S. Open is is about. Um, I'm talking about the women's golf game. So, yeah, and uh, yeah, besides, one other commonality be between golf and tennis is that the girls' games are much more um, appealing to the eye to watch because in tennis, the girls, the, the skirts that they wear, damn, those are hot. Um, especially those who, uh, who wear short skirts and the short skirts in tennis um, I don't know how short they can get, but those, th those cuts were at the exact, the perfect location that, you know, make us want to watch the game, but, you know, not, at the same time, not, not making the game erotic. <laughs> so it, it's, uh, or making us think the game is going to be erotic. See, um, uh, what do you call it? Beach volleyball, yeah, beach volleyball. Of course, it's not an erotic game, but you know, you know, half of the time we're staring at the the, the bums of the um, of, of the of the girls, right? So it's uh, but for tennis, we're staring at their thigh and their legs, their perfectly tanned legs, and that goes that the same goes for golf. Um, watch the women's game, the 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 girls' game, and it's. It's absolutely, well, some of them dress more conservatively, which makes the game more boring. Um, so that's why you can't have golf tournaments uh, in places like New York or, uh, um, I don't know, Minnesota, North Dakota. Uh, 
jackets so that they all have to wear like down feather jackets or or sweatpants but you got to have them at, at places like florida or georgia so they can all wear short skirts that's the beauty of the game literally beauty of the game okay back to the wikipedia page um, more rules of lawn tennis derive from its precursor, and it is reasonable to see both sports as variations of the same game. Most historians believe that tennis was or originated in the monastic cloisters. What is that? Monastic cloisters. Yeah, um, I need to look that up later. So, uh, if you're curious what it is right now, stop this audio and just go look it up but i just think that means something extremely unsexy and religious um because when you think of like monastery and religious stuff in old time france yeah it's everything but sexy um, in northern France in the 12th century, but the ball was then struck with the palm of the hand. Oh, it's like a handball. Hence, um, the name Jus de Palme. Um, I'm, I, I'm sorry that I must have butchered it, but I do not speak the language of French, and I'm just going to call that, quote, Game of the Palm. It was not until the 16th century that the rackets came into use and the game began to be called tennis. It was popular in England and France, and Henry VIII of England was a big fan of the game, now referred to as Real Tennis. So Real Tennis is where you slap the ball with your hand, and I guess uh, the ball would travel a little slower than the racket version of the of this game but and it, you also end up with really red palms after the game um yeah let's keep going many original tennis courts remain including courts at oxford cambridge falkland palace in fife where mary queen of scots regularly played and Hampton Court Palace. Many of the French courts were decommissioned with the terror that accompanied the French Revolution. Oh, what a shame. Mm. That's part of the history of the game, and the French Revolution uh, kind of erased it. Hmm. Well, that's too bad. The Tennis Court Oath. Semaine du de the Palm was a pivotal event during the first days of the French Revolution. The oath was a pledge signed by 576 of the 577 members of the Third Estate who were locked out of a meeting of the Estates General, Estates General, or in, in 20th of June, 1789. The Davis Cup, an annual competition between men's national teams, dates to the 1900s. The analogous competition for women's national teams, the Fed Cup, was founded as the Federation's Cup, the Federation Cup, in 1963 to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the founding of the International Tennis Federation, also known as the ITF. The Davis Cup and the Fed Cup. That's good to know. And um, promoter C.C. Pyle created the first professional tennis tour in 1926. Um, that's right in between the two world wars. By the way, that's how I like to um, keep um, a time, especially in the early, early 1900s, in context. Because I only know about the... The two world wars, one in the 1910s, the other one in the 1930s or the late 30s, early 40s. So that's how I understand or how I understand that, yeah, the context of the history of that time. So the first tennis tour was 
was in 1926. That was still a time at peace, although um, all the traditional European powers have been weakened dramatically by the First World War. Uh, with, okay, going back to the reading, with a group of American and French tennis players playing exhibition matches to paying audiences. The most notable of these early professionals were American Minnie Richards and the, and the French woman Suzanne Langland. Once a player turned pro, he or she could not compete in the major tournaments. Major means amateur. In... Mm, okay, that is kind of a shame because uh, I think back then the skill differences between a professional player, a pro and an amateur is minimal. Kind of like nowadays the pro and amateur difference in porn. Um, you can't hardly tell who's a professional porn star and who's an amateur shooting her first video um, on porn, for, for Pornhub. Um, yeah, it's... Uh, it's probably the exact same way back then for tennis. In 1968, commercial pressures and rumors of some amateurs taking money under the table led to the abandonment of this distinction, inaugurating the now known as the Open Era, and in which all players could compete in all tournaments, and, and the top players were able to make their living from tennis. Oh, I'm guessing these days the top players were not only able to make their living from tennis, but also able to thrive um, and purchase the world with their game or their mastery of the game of tennis. That's just how everything is now. The In every profession or in every game, the profit always goes to the top 5 to 1%, and the rest... Yeah, they're just there because the 1% need to beat somebody. And the the 95% is there really to get beat and to be able to, uh, or, yeah, to be there and to <laughs> to just be a reflection of th those who have succeeded that they have to do something else to uh, make their ends meet. With the beginning of the Open Era, the establishment of an international professional tennis circuit and revenues from the sale of television rights, tennis's popularity has spread worldwide. And as the sport has shed its upper middle class English speaking image, really? Although it is acknowledged that this stereotype still exists, no shit it still exists. Look at the best tennis players in the world. Which one of them came out of the slum? Well, actually, here I thought of a really good example. Um, players of color, such as Serena and Venus Williams, has really been a catalyst of change. Ooh, I made it. Um, for the game of tennis in recent years, because... They have really served as a role model for minority players who want to break through the ranks of top players in the world in this very upper, upper middle class um, oriented game. And hats off to the Williams sisters as well as to all the others who have, yeah, and as well as to like guys like Michael Chang and let's see, what are some other... Asian guys who have broken the uh, bamboo ceiling there. Um, yeah, in any case, they've been an inspiration to a lot of young, up-and-coming young players. And uh, thank you all for, for being there for all of, yeah, all of the future generations and prove it to them that it is possible. That is called a catalyst for change. Where else... Are we going to insert the rest of the mediums or the idioms for today? Meddle with. Let's see. Yeah, it's really difficult to meddle with the score of a tennis game. Probably the only one that, that, that can do that, the only person who can do that is the line judge or the, what do you call it? Yeah, the, the line judge. The line umpire there, the line umpire of the uh, the tennis game, um, 
because it's absolutely their call. So they can be the one to meddle with the score. Um, indispensable. Ah, oh, I have a good one. Indispensable. So learning how to deal with defeat is an indispensable part of every player's journey to become great. Um, because uh, failure is the only experience um, that is going to be helpful to uh, to someone's growth that finally would lead them to success. And that's why having that failure as part of your path is so indispensable. Reflective of their own judgment. How about for all those who have judged me and think of my remarks at the beginning of this video about Asian kids and how Asian kids can be good at tennis but can be too good at tennis at the professional stage. If all, all of you all think of that as being racist, that is reflective of your own judgment. I didn't say it that way, okay? And everything that you think of is just a reflection of your own beliefs. Um, yeah, that's kind of a great way to acquit myself of uh, responsibilities for what I just said. <laughs> um, yeah. Anyways, um, that is kind of my piece today about the history of tennis. And I really hope that young Asian players can, uh, can develop further and see you all at all the Grand Slams and winning all the tournaments in the future. And yeah, I, I really would love to see that happening for both the guys and the girls. Okay, so good luck to you all. And that is all for today. I'm signing off. Peace.